Hello, true art believers, and welcome to tonight's installment of the artist's interview series. Today, slash tonight, I winked there. There's a little wink, a little winking action. Wink. I will be talking with photographer John Scala. John Scala is a professional photographer based in Long Island, New York, who specializes in landscapes, flora, and fauna, and also enjoys getting up at the crack of dawn to capture a good sunrise shot. Before we start, make sure to smash the subscribe button and hit the notifications bell. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. John, John Scala, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Matt. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? I see you have a little bit of a cough today. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I need like, um, was it lozenges, like throat yeah. lozenges? Do yeah. those work? Uh, they give you temporary relief, but uh, that's usually it's 19th century medicine. You know, it's just making you feel better until the body heals itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so John, you were just, you were, <laughs> before we started this interview, like the, we started this, this live stream, you're like, Matt, are we going to talk for an hour or two hours long? And you're wondering how, how we, on earth you talk for an hour or two hours long. And you just said, is like, you just told me, is this true? This is, this is absolute truth coming from your mouth. The, that you have, you've talked for an entire for in your entire life for only two hours of your your lifespan yeah i think if you added up all the words it probably would <laughs> come out to only two hours you know <laughs> i remember seeing a, an article once that said that on average women speak 7500 words a day and men speak 1500 words a day and in my case with my spouse i think it's more like 9500 words for her and 500 for me or or just just five yeah right are you like a um would you call yourself an introvert or are you just like soft spoken no i just feel like uh ironically i think you have a, a you gain a greater sense of respect and um admiration from people by listening rather than talking well today i'm going to be listening right right so i'm gonna to have to switch my normal mode from listen mode to talk mode you're gonna to have to do you have, is there a button for that john uh i'm uh, mentally prepared for it i've switched the uh uh, the toggle switch on in my brain. So there's no real button, but no real physical button to, to turn on the, the talk mode. Right. But I have enabled it. <laughs> you, you, uh, you swiped right, uh, for, to enable. Exactly. So, um, John, how's your day going? Uh, it's going very well. I actually just brought my youngest son, home from college. It was the end of his first year. And, um, you know, it's kind of a long day. It was five hours of driving and packing up all the stuff that he had to bring home. But uh, here we are. It's a nice, peaceful evening uh, on Long Island. I have to correct you, though. In the beginning, you said I live in Long Island. But uh, where we live here, we refer to ourselves as living on Long Island. Since it's an island, you're you're on the island. So, oh, I, I'm so sorry. I, I uh, uh, yeah, that's little... that's the expression we use when you meet somebody and they say, well, "Where do you live?" You say, "Well, I'm on the island." Oh, you're on, okay. You're on the island. So, why did you choose to live on Long Island? Why well, there? It uh, really wasn't my choice initially. It's where I was born, but um, I have lived in other places around the country and i've always come back to long island i've never really found any place that i wanted to move to i've been to a lot of nice places including outside the u.s but 
I really have never found any place that uh, I think uh, I would want to move to from here. You know, where we're located, we're only a 38 minute train ride from Manhattan, which has, uh, you know, the the best of everything uh, in terms of, uh, you know, city life. And if you go in the other direction, you have a, a world famous beach area called the Hamptons, which is a, a great place. And we have a summer home there right on the water. So that's a kind of a totally different vibe, but um, another thing that really appeals to me. And in the middle of the town I live in is really like uh, Mayberry RFD. You know, it's a real small town feel. Everybody knows everybody. It's uh, quiet. It's peaceful. It's clean. It's safe. And so I just don't, uh, I don't see any reason to leave. And um, especially now from a photographic standpoint, uh, Long Island is actually a series of islands you know you have the the main island but then you've got a whole variety of barrier islands and the net result of that is you've got lots of waterways connected by bridges uh, you know the islands i should say are connected by bridges but you've got waterways and fishing piers and jetties and beaches and water towers and uh, just all kinds of bird life and deer and butterflies. And from a photographer's standpoint, there's just so many beautiful places. And that's, I think, really what dominates the, the, the main theme of my work is that it's all photos of the, the great outdoors of Long Island. It's just a beautiful place and there's uh, millions of things to photograph. So I love it here. So, Long Island is really photogenic. It is. It's a really beautiful place. Do you how like when you're when you're working on your photography, what's your like travel range uh, uh, when you're going on a photography like a, a like a route or a photo shoot? Well, I probably will drive up to forty five minutes from where I'm living at the time. You know, as I said, I have two homes, so that kind of expands my range. Long Island, if you've never been here or uh, seen it on a map, is shaped like a fish. So it's about 120 miles long, but it's only about 20 miles, uh, you know, from top to bottom. And so by having a, a home in the east end and a home at the west end, I'm pretty close to m most of the island, uh, depending on which house I'm in. So as I said, you know, if I want to do a particular shoot for a sunrise on a given day, uh, I might drive up to a half an hour or 45 minutes. Um, I don't even mind the drive. Sometimes you find things along the way that you realize uh, either you can stop and get a shot there or you just put it in your memory bank and go back to it another time and continue on uh, to your original destination. But it is good in that way. I know some people when they do, uh, you know, their, their photo shoots, they've got to get on a plane and go to another country and then hike up a mountain and then go down a zip line and then cross a river and, and then finally set up their tripod. Um, but um, I don't I don't find it to be that onerous. I also get a lot of great photos just in my backyard because um, I do include macro photography. And so I've gotten some nice shots of just very close up pictures of flowers and trees with water dripping off of them or dew drops in the morning and uh, tiny mushrooms that, that just grow out of the ground after a, you know, an evening rain. And uh, you have to get them while you can, because if you don't, the squirrels and the rabbits will get them, you know, an hour later. So, um, as I said, I, I really, I've got a whole 
a whole world of opportunities that are, you know, within 45 minutes. And like I said, if I'm, if I'm in uh, my West home, that gives me a certain terrain. And then if I'm in my Eastern end home, I've, I've got another set of areas that I can explore. What's, and, uh, what's a macro, like a macro, what's macro photography, you know, what macro, does that, what does that entail? Like, what do you, what, what, gear do you need to to capture those fine details well i mean the best thing really to have is a macro lens and macro just means that it allows you to focus up very very close so if you think about uh you know if you see a a ladybug walking uh on your wall in your home and you try to take a picture of it with a regular uh, lens, let's say a 50 millimeter lens or a 100 millimeter lens, you're not going to be able to get very close to it and zoom, or I should say, and focus on it. So if you take the picture, you might get a sharp picture, but it might represent only this tiny little piece of the frame. Whereas with a, a macro lens, you can get in very close and depending on what kind of lens, you know, sometimes as close as, you know, a half an inch or an inch, in which case the image looks this big in your frame, you know, and that's kind of cool when you can. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's it's not just, uh, I use a ladybug as an example, but, you know, like I said, uh, I like to do uh, morning shots when there's either been rain I have a plum tree in my backyard. So when it blooms and water droplets are just about to drop off of it and you can get in real close and get the flower sharp and the droplet looks like it's just about to come off. Mm -hmm. You know, you can almost feel it ready to go. Um, so that that's macro photography. It's basically just real up close photography. How much does a, a macro lens cost? Um, well, I'm sure there's a whole range of prices, you know, I mean, but I would say to someone who wants to get into photography, the lens more than the camera is where you should devote your dollars because, you know, you can't replace good glass. Yeah. You know, most camera bodies, even ones that only cost a few hundred dollars, will take a good picture. But if you have a, a bad lens, then, you know, you're, you're really uh, handicapping yourself. So I don't remember how much I paid for my macro lens. One of the things that you should try to do is instead of buying camera equipment in particular, I think you need to buy at a camera store and develop a relationship with the camera owner, you know, the camera store owner, I should say, because uh, the lens I have, for example, I got from somebody who sold it back to him and I, I got it for about half the price of what it normally would have cost. And yeah, I think maybe I paid $400 for it, but brand new, it probably would have cost close to 800 or a thousand. But that's not the kind of thing that you can't have that kind of relationship on Amazon, you know. And also, if you're an aspiring photographer, you're eventually going to run into situations that you don't know how to handle, um, camera settings that you don't know how to access. And it really isn't right to buy your camera on Amazon and then go into your camera store and try to ask his advice when you didn't really give him any business. And as I said, most of the time, if you develop a reasonable relationship with them, and it doesn't mean like you're spending train loads of money, it just means they see your face and they know you're a customer. They're going to look out for things like that. They're going to say, hey, you know, I just got this lens in and I can give it to you for a, a good price. Are you interested? And if you're not, you're not. But I've picked up some very good lenses that way. And uh, as I said, that's really why you, where, where you want to focus your attention. You could get an inexpensive body, but you, you should get good glass. 
How many lenses do you own? Uh, probably more than I can remember. I have probably seven or eight. And um, I mean, I would say three of them are the ones that are my workhorses. Uh, one is the macro, because like I said, that's something that I can literally just walk outside uh, after the rain or when things start to bloom and get uh, some good shots there. Another one is a, uh, a Nikkor 28 to 300. So that means it's a zoom lens. It goes anywhere from 28 millimeters, which is a fairly wide angle view. You know, a normal view is 50 millimeters. So a 50 miller, millimeter, if you look through it, it's going to look the same as if you were just looking at the person without a camera. So 28 millimeters is going to look a wider angle. It's going to make the person seem farther away yeah. and encompass more of the scenery. So then as you zoom in into the, all the way out to the 300 millimeters, now you're reaching and you're bringing that, the, the moon closer. You know, you're bringing that distant object closer to you. There are certain things, you know, you never get close to birds. You know, so if you want to take photographs of birds, you almost always have to use a zoom lens where you're anywhere from 300 to 600 millimeters because the birds are just, they're not going to let you get close. So that I use a lot because that, depending on the situation, I could be anywhere from 28 to 300 and anywhere in between. And then my third main lens is a... a another wide angle lens that goes anywhere from 16 millimeters, which is a very wide angle. And I use that a lot for my landscape shots. Um, and it'll zoom from 16 to 35. So 35 is still pretty wide angle, but it, it gives me that flexibility to try to compose exactly the way I want it. I don't always want it to be super wide and I don't always want it to be 35. So it could be anywhere in between. Those three lenses, I would say, I use most of the time. But I do have, for example, a fisheye lens, which is uh, it's a specialty lens. It's the ultimate in wide-angle lens. It actually shoots 180-degree view. So if I were to take a picture straight out like this with uh, a wide-angle lens, with the uh, fisheye lens, it would take a picture of everything from this horizon to this horizon, this, this entire scene, which is pretty wild. And um, it's not something that you take a lot of pictures with, but, you know, when I go on vacation, I bring it with me, and there's always one or two situations where you can get a specialty. In fact, I won a, um, uh, an image of the year was shot with a fisheye lens inside a... Um, a uh, church in Harlem called St. John the Divine. And there was a beautiful, beautiful chapel, rows of seats and stained glass windows and tile floor. And it was just beautiful. And I could have just taken a straight shot with everything square and looking exactly the way it looks to your naked eye. But instead I took it with the fisheye lens and the whole scene is rounded. And it's just, it's something that your, your eye can't see. And you don't generally see in most images. Either. Yeah. So that uh, was deemed by the judges to be uh, the image of the year um, for, for the, the year that I was uh, at the, uh, I was a member of the Nassau County Camera Club and they would do monthly um photo contests where you'd submit three photos and they'd pick a photo of the month. And then at the end of the year, as I said, they'd pick a, a, a image of the year. And my, that the, the one time that, that uh, you know, uh, I took that uh, fisheye shot and uh, it paid off because, uh, you know, I was rewarded at least with uh, a pat on the back. You know? Are you still a part of that group? 
No, um, COVID kind of put an end to it. And um, I also, I realized that it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And it's a, it's a great group. I don't want to say anything bad about them because I had a good time. But I thought it was going to be more groups going out to different places and photographing stuff together and maybe gaining access to areas that me as an individual wouldn't have access to. And that's really wasn't, wasn't really their focus. It was more about the photo contests. Like every mm. month, every month they'd have a photo contest. And um, like I said, I, I did it for one season. Uh, you know, I did well, uh, but I just, I, I didn't want to focus on just trying to win a contest. I was, yeah. more, I was more interested in trying to, you know, look at what I saw in front of me and try to interpret it and capture what I wanted on film and, or I should say on the, on the sensor and, and not worry about, you know, what somebody else thought, uh, or, or trying to satisfy, you know, there's, there's a bias where after a while you start knowing what the judges are looking for and you start taking pictures, you know, to win the contest. And I, did, I didn't want to go down that route. But, um, yeah, that's weird uh, about those competitions where I, I've heard uh, photographers and other artists say that they would just research these artists or these, these judges and, and look up their bias on like what they like as an artist. Yeah. And then they would they would make work to cater towards them. I always thought that was a weird thing to do because it's almost like you're sacrificing yourself just for a a a, uh, a mark or a, a a a a notch on your belt, you know. And really, when it, when you're doing that, I, to me, it feels like it almost feels like it's almost meaningless, right? Because you're just you're not really making work for you or you're making a, like a photo for you or an artwork for you. You're, you're kind of catering towards someone else's like uh, aesthetics. And then, uh, yeah, it's kind of like putting a, like doing a little cheat sheet, I guess. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you an example of how the way they look at things the way, versus the way I look at things. Like there's a concept in photography called negative space. And negative space is very simply everything that's not the subject. So picture a surfer standing on the shoreline, holding onto his surfboard and just looking out at the waves and sort of assessing the situation. The surfer with his board is the subject and everything else, the sky, the sand, the ocean, that's all negative space. But I like, photos where the subject is small and the negative space is large because it gives you a sense of scale. You know, the ocean is infinitely larger than a person. And so, and, it's, and same thing with the sky. And so I have an image, for example, of exactly that um, in a, one of my favorite places to do photos. Photography is uh, Long Beach. New York. It's a beautiful, beautiful beach, and it's it's a good place for surfing. And I had this exact situation. I just saw this one guy standing on the shore holding a surfboard, and I, I took a picture of him, but I took it from far away. So he's small in the frame, and you have just the bigness of the sky. The sky was beautiful. The beach was nice. The water was nice. We had big waves. And... Um, I was really trying to emphasize the sense of scale about how how big the ocean and the sky and the beach are. Yeah. And I did that by showing how small he is. And in camera clubs, what they would say is the surfer is the subject. So the focal should, point. So you should crop the image in to just emphasize all this other space is just wasted space, and I, I completely disagree with that. Is that is that a um, is that a like a a type of like uh, aesthetic that photographers 
really abide by. Like they, they really want to have a specific focal point in their compositions. Well, you always want to have a subject, you know, you, you should always be able to say to somebody, what is this a picture of? And they should be able to answer it. Yeah. So whether it's a surfer or it's a butterfly or it's a, uh, a sunrise or a bridge, you know, you, you need to have a subject. It's not enough to just say, well, the whole thing is the, is the photo. You know what I mean? It's everything. It's the trees and the air and the water and the, it's, you need to have a focal point. Yeah. But the focal point doesn't need to fill the whole frame. And, you know, when you come to the subject of composition, there are opposing um, ways of approaching it. One is what I just said, this idea of negative space, where you intentionally make the subject small to show the bigness of the environment. And the opposite is what I talked about earlier, where you get the ladybug to just fill the whole frame. You know what I mean? Almost end to end. So those are different compositional techniques. Um, they're both valid. And it's not that you want to have all of one or all of the other. Um, but as I said, I knew after a few rounds of watching the competitions that the ones with the negative space and the small subject wouldn't do well. And yeah. I, I happen to like those. That's why I have the wide angle lens. When you have a, uh, the wider the angle of the lens, the farther away the thing you're photographing appears. Yeah. So if you're standing 10 feet in front of me and I have a 50 millimeter camera, the picture is going to look like it looked in real life. But if I have a 16 millimeter lens, you're going to look like you're far back. And a lot of the surrounding area around you is going to be included in the in the frame. Yeah. And as I said earlier, you know, my 16 to 35 millimeter is one of my go-to. And very often I'm all the way at 16. You know, I'm just very wide and um, just trying to take in the whole scene and then having one focal point, but have it be small compared to the overall largeness of the scene. I guess it's just a, maybe a bias from living at the ocean. You know, I mean, there are times when I have images where it's just, uh, you know, one tree at night, yeah. you know, at midnight, and it's, you know, you're positioned low and you're looking up at the stars and you just see the vastness of space. You don't want space to look like this. You know, you want it to look enormous. Yeah, of course. You know, so. Well, that's just the, the what I'm gathering. That's kind of like the thing that you like doing the most. You enjoy um, showing a large open world as opposed to having the the subject matter, as you said, take up 80% of the, the, the photo. Well, it depends. Like I said, if I go out in my backyard and I can find a great macro photo, Usually those are, you know, fill the frame type yeah. compositions where you might have just one blade of grass with a leaf, you know, sliding down yeah. or a series of little dew drops on it. Um, you know, I have an image where it's, it's just the head of a tulip mm -hmm. all covered in dew. Mountain dew. What, what, yeah, the Mountain Dew, right. No, that, <laughs> the one thing we don't have on Long Island is mountains. Um, <laughs> but th this is d definitely a fill the frame composition. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not the whole flower. You don't see the ground. You don't see the sky. Um, and ju that just happened to be there. You know, I went out in the morning and it was a dew covered morning. You don't always get dew on things. It depends on the air temperature versus the ground temperature but um if i can get it great it's right there it's in my backyard take click and there's the photo done yeah but the uh, the landscape ones are usually the ones where i'm getting up at 4 30 in the morning and 
driving to a location where I know the sun is going to be rising here and the lighthouse is going to be, you know, right in front of it. Yeah. And if I can get the two together, then it'll make a nice shot. Um, so that I would typically, you know, I, I might use a wide angle lens for that. John, what was it? What was like art? What was art like for you as a kid? Um, it really didn't play a big part for me. Um, the only thing that I could point to that, uh, that represented art for me at an earlier stage in my life is that in my late teens and through most of my 20s, I was in the restaurant business. I, I was a cook and eventually a head chef of a restaurant. Uh, and, you know, cooking is an artistic pursuit, uh, at least, you know, at the level I was doing it. We weren't running a cafeteria, you know, I was running a, a, a fine restaurant, so the food was really good. But um, I was not particularly um, interested in art. I really got into photography late in life. Yeah. And um, it was really the result of having children, you know, because once you have kids, you just want to take pictures of them. They just, they look different every day. You know, they're, they're never going to look the same. If I take a picture of my son when he's two, he's never going to look that way again, you know? And so that's what really got me going with photography. But then I started becoming really fascinated with the whole concept of how differently your eye sees things versus how the camera sees things. You know, it's a very common thing. You've probably heard people that they'll show you a photo and they'll say, well, this really doesn't do it justice. You had to be there. It looked, yeah. really, it looked much better in real life. And um, that's just the nature of the beast. You know, as humans, we have two eyes and a brain and a camera has one eye and no brain. And so it just can't, record uh, the same way that we can see. Mm -hmm. And so learning that is one of the first things that you have to come to grips with in photography. Um, even just changing direction, you know, if the sun is over there and you take a picture facing that way, it's going to look a certain way. If you turn 90 degrees, uh, 180 degrees the other way, it's going to look completely different. So just knowing which direction to face uh, and also learning where the sun is going to be. So you become a little bit of a, a weatherman and uh, an astronomer. But the flip side of that is that the camera can do things and, and capture things that the human eye can't see. So the example is the, uh, the, the fisheye lens that I talked about, you know, the image that I captured with the fisheye lens cannot be seen with the naked eye. So that's another sort of fascinating aspect of photography is learning what you can do that the, the human eye can't do. I mean, a simple example is black and white. We don't see in black and white. Uh, the closest you'll get to seeing things in black and white is after a, a snowfall. Things, uh, things tend to look kind of black and white then. But uh, another example would be, you know, if you were shooting a bridge that had a series of lights along it and you use a certain aperture, like an F, F22, for example, which is a very small opening in the camera, what happens is the lights, instead of just looking like, you know, bright balls of glare, they turn into stars. They, they literally have like points. Okay. They hit, start coming like halation? Yeah, they become like sun stars, we call them. And again, that's not something you can see with your eyes. What about if you squint really hard so things become blurry? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. I haven't tried that, but <laughs> the, the, the camera makes it so that it's, you know, it's permanent on the... Uh, on the page, you know, you know, you don't have to keep squinting. Yeah, you don't have to keep it like squinting like this real sharp. So, think, so things come like kind of flickery. Right. 
And, you know, another example of what the camera can do that your eyes can't do is if you do a long exposure photography, you know, a normal uh, shot is you just go click and the shutter is only open for one two hundred and fiftieth of a second. Yeah, I know in, that. In a, in a, just a normal, you know, click type of a photo. But depending on the situation you're in, you can get images where you're using five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, even up to five or 10 minutes. And just by uh, way of example, what will happen is if you use, let's say, a 30 second exposure of a bridge going over a waterway, the water is going to look smooth. All the choppiness gets smoothed out by having this long exposure. And then it reflects the lights from the bridge. And again, it's something that your eyes can't see. What your eyes see when you're standing there is just this choppy water. Mm -hmm. And because it's choppy, it's not really that reflective. So that's another cool aspect of uh, what a camera can capture that the, the naked eye can't. And there are other subjects, other things, but that'll just give you a, a few things about it. Um, so that, that's one of the things that fascinated me. And then, you know, what started happening is I really started liking photography. I think I came to it at a time when my, um, my main career was sort of winding down. And, How so? Uh, well, just age. You know, I'm 61, and I had been working at the same company for 34 years. What what company was that? Uh, it's Merrill Lynch. Okay. And um, what'd you do there? Uh, I was a fa financial advisor, and so I felt like I don't know that I want to retire, retire, and just do nothing, but to have uh, a, you know, a profession that you could do that you enjoy and maybe not necessarily that you're doing it to make a million dollars. You know, you're not going to put your kids through college most of the time on what you're going to make selling uh, photography prints. But I liked the idea of having a job that wasn't as taxing. It was more enjoyable. Yeah. But, but yet you could still be doing something productive. And I also hated the idea that my images were just sitting inside my computer. And so when I- You wanted to share print, them to the world. Exactly. When I sell a print to somebody, and, and most of the people who buy my prints are people who don't know me. You know, I promote myself and my, my website on social media and- um, so most of the prints that are purchased are by people that I don't know. I never yeah. meet them. I never see them. But it still gives me a sense of satisfaction knowing that somebody liked the image enough to buy it and hang it up in their home. And um, I like that uh, really more than just, like I said, having it in my computer. You know, you take a picture, you like it, you put it on Facebook. You know, if you think about the way people deal with Facebook, you look at it on your phone, you scroll up, and it's gone forever. Because you never scroll back down. You know what I mean? You look at that photo and you say, oh, that's nice. You scroll up and it's gone. I, I scroll back down. I go up and down. All right. Well, I'm not always going. I'm not always doing this. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go back down. Okay. All right. Well, um, John, John, could you give me... Could you give me some financial advice? What should I be doing? Well, you should be funding your retirement accounts. If you have an IRA, if you, are you self-employed? A little bit of both. Okay. I, well, I'm an employee and an employer. Okay. Well, if you're, if you're I'm not an employer, just like it, like, uh, what's it called when you're, when you're specialized, when you're, or you're, uh, you're like a, a Soul practitioner. Yeah, soul practitioner. I'm, you know, uh, I'm an employee and a soul practitioner. Right. Well, the company that you work for, if they have a 401k plan, you should contribute to it. Okay. Uh, because that money is going to come out pre-tax 
which means if you put in a dollar, it's probably only 70 cents out of pocket because if you didn't make the contribution, you'd have to pay 30 cents in taxes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's free money. Plus most employers will match at least a portion of your contribution. So yeah, something like 2%. Yeah, so that's more free money. And what, as you invest that money and it grows, you don't pay taxes on it until you take it out, which, you know, presumably is going to be, you know, many, many years down the road. So you're getting the, the benefit of tax deferred growth. Yeah. So I would say putting money into retirement accounts is your best bet. What else? Um, well, don't have credit card debt. Okay. Because credit cards almost all are charging you over 10% interest. Woo! And so if you've got credit card, it's amazing to me how many people would tell me they owe 20000 on their credit cards mm -hmm. and they're paying 18% interest. And then over here, they've got a bank account with 50,000 and they're earning 1%. Yeah. Like yeah. why are you you're going backward by 17%, you know? So just pay off that credit card and don't build up a balance anymore. It's okay to, it's okay to use credit cards, but just set it up so that you pay the bill every month. Mm -hmm. And this way you don't build up any uh, balance and you don't pay interest. What if you don't have a credit card? You should get one. I've tried. They keep rejecting me. Uh, that, um, uh, this is a funny story. I, I was like, I tried to apply for like the the Amazon like card, right? You know, because I wanted to um, build up some credit. I was like, I need a computer. The computer I'm using right now. And I was, you know what? I was thinking to myself, you know what? Uh, I do need to build some credit. Let's apply for their their credit card. I, I'm assuming that they would. Uh, I've been doing business with them for obviously forever. Everyone has. And I figured maybe I can uh, 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 be able to get my foot in the door and get a credit card from them or a little or like a charge card because they offered it. And um, I was like, OK, let's do this. And I fill out all the stuff and I'm like, oh, um, you're denied. Uh, maybe you might be we might accept you on the like the lower tier credit card that they had. They like two tiers or whatever. Don't right. remember all of what it was. And. I okay, I'll, I'll 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 apply for that one and see what happens. And they're like, no, no, you can't. You are not accepted. Uh, you don't meet the requirements. And I was like, you know what, Amazon? I don't care. I'm gonna buy the a computer outright right now. I didn't need the I didn't need the card. I was just going to buy, uh, use the card to pay for it. But I was going to pay for it up front because I don't have one, so I don't depend on a card. So I just bought like a a, a computer. Um, straight up up front all the money that you needed for it because I was going to do it anyways, regardless of whether or not I had the card. Uh, I just figured it'd be a, a good way to kind of build that credit. Well, what you can look into is what some banks will do is they will give you a what's called a secured credit card, meaning you open an account with them, you put $2,000 on deposit, and then they will give you a credit card with a $2,000 limit. And this way they know that they're not really taking any credit risk because they have $2,000 of your money. So even if you never pay them back, they'll just keep your $2,000. But in the meanwhile, as you use that card and pay it off, hopefully promptly, yeah, you will be establishing credit. And then eventually you'll be able to get another credit card that's not a secured credit card. What are your thoughts on Dave's, Dave Ramsey's uh, 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 quote of, of um, if you have a credit card, all that means is you're really good at paying debt or paying off debt. Something like that. It's one of those quotes. I don't know if that's the direct translation. Yeah, I don't really. I know who Dave Ramsey is. I I, don't, I haven't read any of his books or, or subscribed to any of his newsletters or anything. But yeah, what he what he probably is referring to is what I was saying earlier: the idea of maintaining balances. 
you know, where you owe 10 or 20 or 30,000 and every month you're making a payment. And part of that is interest. But if you have a credit card, I mean, I have an American Express card and I have it set up so that the bill is automatically deducted from my checking account each month. Yeah. So I'm never late and I never pay interest. And that's to me is just convenience. So if I don't have cash, I just give them the card, they swipe it and I'm out the door. I don't have to have, you know, $1,200 on me if I want to buy, uh, you know, something expensive. I, 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 would, I used to listen to him a lot uh, uh, because I had some student loan debt I had to pay off. And I was like, well, how am I going to pay off the student loan? There's a lot, a lot of money. So it's, it's gone. But now uh, I was listening to some of these people talk about their their debt that they have and dave would ask them so what's your uh, yearly uh, uh, income between the both of you and they're like oh three hundred fifty thousand dollars you know like this you know really <laughs> you know quite a lot when compared to myself and they're like and then like so um how much are you in debt and then they'd say you know x amount and and dave's like yeah you should be able to pay that off in like a month I don't know why why you're calling me. You should be you're making three hundred fifty thousand dollars and you're not able to pay that off. They're like, well, I have all these nice things that I don't want to give up. <laughs> really, what it boils down to, like, I have all these really nice things I don't want to give up. I have a nice car, a nice boat, or a yacht, or whatever it is, a really big house. And and Dave's like, sell the house, sell one of your cars, sell the yacht or boat. There you go. Your 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 debt will be uh, finished within like two months. That's all you got to do. And they're, and they're like, I don't want to do that. I want to I want to be able to do do it the way that I'm doing it right now. It's like clearly it's not going to work out because apparently you're just like blowing. You're like you're hemorrhaging money. I don't know what you're doing with your money, but it's going it's going into a fire pit apparently. Yeah, you well, ever- there are people who no matter how much money they make, uh, they'll always manage to spend a little bit more than that. And they'll they'll be in the hole. Yeah, when as when you were a financial advisor, what what are some um, interesting stories that you had have, that you acquired, like some people that you had to, to work with, like some person that had that made this X amount of money, but they just couldn't seem to to get their finances in order. And you're like, you should be able to get, you should be able to do this really easily. You just need to not do that thing that you're doing. Yeah, I would say that the, uh, I wouldn't say that they're amusing stories, but I would say the challenges that I had when I was in that industry was people who want to try to time the market. You know, like they want to look into the crystal ball and say, okay, the market is at a high, so I want to sell everything now. And then when it drops, I want to put it back in at a lower price. And, you know, it's just in order to do that, it means you have to be right twice. You have to be right on when to get out and then right on when to get back in. And even if you are right for that one time, it's not a strategy that you're going to be able to employ over a lifetime. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's better to set up an investment strategy and stick with it and focus more on the long term. You know, I mean, if you think about where the stock market is today, it's at an all time high. But it was at an all time high five years ago. And it was at an all time high 10 years ago. And it was at an all time high when I started back in the mid 80s. So, you know, there is no top to the stock market, you know. if you're going to invest, you just have to do certain things. You have to identify money that you don't need for a long period of time. You know, if you know you're going to need the money to buy a car or pay for a wedding or something like that, then you keep that on the side. But like I said about your 401k and your IRA, those are dollars that you literally can't even touch until you're in your at least your 60s. Yeah. And you look like a youngster. So, uh, you know, your money is going to be invested for decades. Yeah. And so you have to ask yourself, well, where's the market going to be decades from now, not a year from now? Or, you know, after Biden raises taxes or, you know, some short term 
thing that may or may not happen. It's just focusing on the long term and just staying with it. It's like owning a home, you know. I mean, most people, if they buy a house and they keep it for 20 or 30 years, it almost certainly is going to appreciate substantially. Yeah. You know, and it's the stock market works the same way. It doesn't necessarily go up in a straight line and it get it's it's a lot more volatile, but ultimately, you know, corporate profits keep going up and that's what drives stock prices. What are your uh, um what are your thoughts on like the 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 average American and 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 how they're dealing with um uh their future? Cuz I I I know I don't know this fact is I don't 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 quote me this is not necessarily true, but I heard this fact or this 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 percentage that like the average American like 70% 78% of Americans can't afford like a, a six hundred dollar like emergency fund, or they don't have six hundred dollars yeah, outside of their paycheck. Yeah, it's true. the The average American is not in good shape financially. What What's your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are it's uh, eventually going to come home to to roost because you know when you get to the point where you're not working anymore, your company decides well you're you're no longer useful, we're going to lay you off. And yeah. You didn't use the past 40 years to accumulate a nest egg, then you're going to be living on Social Security, which is peanuts. Yeah. You know? So it's uh, it's it's not a good situation. When you were uh, uh, working as a financial advisor, did you encounter a lot of uh, uh, customers like that? Uh, it's funny. You know, I would be, I'd end up at a party and I'd be talking to somebody and they'd say, what do you do for a living? And they'd say, oh, I'd say, oh, well, I'm a financial advisor. And they'd say, oh, I need to talk to you. I, I'm, I'm a complete wreck with my finances. And I would have to say, no, ma'am, you, you misunderstood. I'm a financial advisor for rich people. <laughs> 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 oh, that's real good. That is good. That is a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have these people who are di they're in dire straits and they want me to wave a wand and somehow, you know, their debt's going to go away and their house is going to get paid off and their investments are going to grow. And uh, it just doesn't work that way. You know, it's, uh, it's a long, slow process, usually. Yeah. You know, like I talked about with your 401k before, that's supposed to be something where every month a couple of hundred bucks comes out and then they put a couple of dollars on top and then it grows and you do that for 30 years and all next thing you know, it's $500,000. You Do you like 401ks or Roth IRAs more? I like them both. Uh, typically what we tell clients is put in enough in the 401k to get the full company match. And then if you still have uh, money that you can invest, put it in a Roth because the Roth is tax free forever. Mm -hmm. The 401k you'll eventually pay taxes when you take the money out. The Roth is tax free now and it's tax free later. And in fact, when you get to the age where you're required to take money out of your retirement accounts, the Roth, is an exception to that rule. You don't have to take money out yeah. if you don't want to. And, and a lot of times, you know, my clients end up where they don't really need the money from their IRAs because their homes are paid off. They've saved money. They've invested. They're in good shape. Their kids are out of the house. And so they don't need to take, but the government requires it. That's, yeah. that's just the rules. So they take 30,000 out of their IRA they pay 12,000 in taxes. They put the 18 back into their non IRA investment account. And all they did is lose $12,000. I hear, um, after a certain, like if you make a certain amount of, uh, yearly earnings, uh, you can't, you can't contribute to an IRA. Is that true? No, you can always contribute to an IRA, but if you're part of a 401 K, and you make over a certain amount, okay, then you lose the tax deduction. 
Interesting. But you, can, but you can still put the money in and get tax deferred growth. Um, there are similar rules that apply to Roth IRAs that if your income is above a certain level, you can't make a contribution because they don't want to give a tax benefit to rich people. Well, that's people. that's what I was saying. Like if you make a certain amount, yeah, you're not able to contribute. Exactly. Uh, and I, I, and it, those those numbers change, you know, annual not annually but periodically. You know, mm -hmm. they're indexed for inflation. Um, it also depends on whether you're filing singly or yeah. married or, you know, um, but it's they're easy. You just, you can, you can Google that info and get the data within two seconds. Did you ever, when, whenever you said that, that rich person, a uh, rich person joke, did they ever get offended? <laughs> I didn't really care. They weren't going to be customers of mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, Contribute to a Roth IRA or 401k um, if your company matches um, or if your company if your company offers a 401k or retirement. Right. Um, and just to do enough, just contribute enough that they match. Uh, right. And, not. Um, and what about savings? What, what do you suggest to the average Joe? Like how much should they put in savings each month? Well, there's all kinds of formulas. You know, I mean... The most common one is that you should take 10% of your gross income and put it in some type of savings account. So if, you know, if part of that's already going to a 401k and part of it's going to a Roth, that counts toward the 10%. So let's say just for argument's sake, you made $100,000 and you put 5,000 in your 401k and you put 5,000 in your Roth that's 10,000, you, there's your 10%. But let's say you don't have a 401k and you put 5,000 into your Roth, then you would want to put 5,000 into something else, just a regular non-retirement account investment. Mm -hmm. So um, what should the average Joe have in their savings account? Well, typically I think the best thing for most people is mutual funds where you have diversified, professionally managed portfolios. You know, um, I mean, it's great to to look at companies like Amazon that have gone up, you know, a thousand fold. But for every stock like that, I could give you another stock like GE that went from 70 to eight. And they're at eight right now? They got as low as eight, but they're, they're still in the in the low you know, single high single digit, low double digit number. Um, and I mean, if you think about it, that's that's almost worse than than the the positive of owning a stock that goes yeah. up 10 or 15 times because yeah. you've lost 90 percent of your money. Yeah. And you can't make back a 90 percent loss. I hear GE uh, is investing heavily in lots of and, and, and 3D printing technology. Have well, you heard about that? They're investing in lots of different things, but it still didn't stop the stock from going from 70 to eight. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that weird, huh? And that's, that's the problem. And even companies like, uh, you know, some food companies, um, I'm trying to think of the stock I was talking about recently. It's one of the big food names. See, I don't Walmart. No, no, it wasn't Walmart. Kmart. No, no, not not retailers. The manufacturers like uh, like uh, like Campbell Soup. You know, uh, it wasn't Campbell Soup, but it was a company like that. Anyway, the stock went from a hundred to thirty. Now, most people would say that would never yeah, happen to that would never happen to a food company. You know, we all eat food. And prices go up. You know, over time. Um, but oh, it was Kraft. That's raft. Right. Yeah. But what shifted is people started saying, you know what? I don't want to eat cheese that's made out of oil and yellow dye. I want to eat natural cheese at like a Chipotle. Yeah. So, so you've had this health craze where people are moving more toward natural foods. Yeah. And away from canned soup that has a high salt content or the cheese that I talked about that's really made out of oil. So 
Kraft Foods, which for you know decades was a great stock and just went up, went down. And you know, in a in a diversified mutual fund, you eliminate the risk of that what we call single stock risk. I mean, Apple, as good as it is, for a time almost went bankrupt. You know, so yeah. th those things happen. You know, and. Um, so I think mutual funds is the best way to go. Outside of a Roth IRA, <laughs> sorry, outside of a Roth IRA and a 401k and a savings. Uh, well, I mentioned paying off the credit cards. Oh, paying off the credit cards, yeah. And, you know, I mean, you should always make sure that your mortgage is low. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, mortgage rates are at all time lows now. So if you're if you still have a mortgage at you know four and a half, five, six percent, you should definitely refinance that because you can get it down to probably around the threes, um, you know, depending on your credit score and all that. So that's about it. I mean, if you do those things, if you manage your debt effectively and you're saving through these various vehicles on a regular basis then what's going to happen is little by little, your asset base is going to get bigger, your debts are going to get smaller, and your net worth is going to grow. And then you'll have money to buy photography prints. <laughs> that's that's how it works. You save your money, uh, uh, invest in Roth, in a Roth IRA, 10% of your, your yearly or monthly earnings. Yearly. Yearly earnings comes out and, to the same thing. Yeah, and and uh, and then invest in art prints. Right. That's 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 the strategy of of every financial advisor ever I've ever sat with. They told me to do that, right. and I was like, well, art prints. Why? Listen, they're like Tommy. Listen, Matt. Art prints are only going to going to go up in value. They never depreciate. Well, and eventually I'm going to die, and then there won't be any more supply of them. And so, you know, just like the great masters, you know, there are no more Da Vinci's, no more uh, uh, Rembrandt's, you know, so they keep going up in, in value because the scarcity, there's only so yeah. many of them out there. John, what's, what's up? Thank you for sharing me all the, sharing that information about like uh, uh, being a financial advisor. Sure. All right. Um, and um, do you, you were you were a cook for a little while. Yep. What uh, do you still cook uh, f for fun, like seriously, or do you just like throw in more craft foods? No, I do the cooking at home, and everything is fresh made. I don't I don't open cans and boxes. Um, I, I I go to the local market uh, almost daily and pick up whatever I feel like eating that day. Fresh fish, fresh vegetables, meat, whatever it might be. Um, my cooking is much more simple now than when I had a restaurant, because in a restaurant, it's almost expected that you're going to kind of like wow the diner. You know, yeah. they don't want just a piece of steak and and, the, and a baked potato next to it. You know, they want something interesting and uh, creative. You know, it's almost like with photography. If I just took a picture of a flower. And you say, okay, I've, I've, I've seen, you know, flowers before, but if you could do something creative, uh, an interesting angle, or like I said, uh, you know, dew drops on it or something, something that uh, would draw the eye, you know? Um, so that's where we are cooking wise. What's, what's a typical like work day for you? Like how, how does a typical work day function? Um, well, typical work day is making sure that I post on social media. You know, I have to post on Facebook, Instagram, um, virtually every day because, you know, part of the problem with Facebook now, as you know, is that they don't show everything that you post to everybody that follows you. Yeah. Which they used to. You know, if you had a thousand followers and you posted something, all thousand of them had it show up in their feed. And it doesn't work that way anymore. And so you have to sort of carpet bomb 
Facebook now. Yeah, yeah. You know, to to hopefully, you know, you'll catch something, so you'll see. Oh, there's a nice print that John posted. And you won't see all of them, but maybe in the course of the week, you'll see some of them, and I'll I'll, I'll stay in your mind. You know. Do you have a cup of coffee in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. I like my coffee, and um, so it's uh, it's coffee in the morning, and uh, I go to the gym around noon. I'm a golfer, so I try to get in a round of golf uh, once or twice a week. I uh, was in a golf tournament yesterday and won a hundred bucks. One hundred dollars. One hundred dollars. Yes, there was a one hole. It was a two hundred yard par three, and if you hit the green with your tee shot, you won a hundred dollar credit for the pro shop. So I smacked my five wood right to the middle of the green. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And um, so you're you're doing social media. I'm assuming in the morning. Um. It could be in the morning. It could be in the afternoon. You know, there are different theories on when to post. I'm not sure any of them are valid, but um, it depends. I mean, you know, if I have something to do in the morning that I don't get a chance to post, I can do it later in the day. I can even do it, you know, remotely. I can take images. I have Lightroom Mobile on my phone. Yeah. So my whole library of photos is in my phone. Yeah. And I can just, um, you know, download one of them to Facebook, type up a description of the image, where I took it, you know, what inspired me, what I liked about it, etc. cetera. Um, and then I can just copy and paste the whole thing into Instagram and that can cover me for the day. But I, I usually try to put more effort into it. You know, I also have a blog on my website where... I'll post images and, uh, I, you know, I always try to include a story about the photo, not just, yeah. just, not just the picture, but where it was taken, when it was taken, what I like about it. Um, maybe, you know, what challenges existed, uh, you know, I mean, I've taken some sunrise photos and total fog and you, you, you drive there thinking I'm not going to get anything. It's too foggy. And then the sun comes up and all of a sudden the, the entire sky turns bright orange because the sunlight is bouncing around on all these billions of droplets that make up fog. And, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is, I, I couldn't have hoped for something better than this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You never, you never know. That's the thing about sunrise photos as opposed to a sunset. I mean, you can tell if the sunset photo is going to be good or not. You know, if the clouds are super, super thick, you're not going to have a sunset. And if there are no clouds at all, if it's just a clear blue sky, again, you're not going to have a really colorful sunset. But if you have, you know, nice little stripes of clouds, you know, a medium amount, then you're going to have some colorful uh, sunsets. But with sunrises, you really are going on the blind because no matter what they say on the weather forecast the night before, you just don't know what you're going to get. Like I said, that example of the, of the it's called foggy sunrise. Uh, I drove about 45 minutes to the location I wanted to shoot. And the whole way there, I thought to myself, why don't I just turn around and get back into bed? I'm not going to get anything. And I got a great photo. It's uh, just this beautiful bright orange with the sun coming up right behind the Fire Island Lighthouse. And, um, you know, it's just, it's a leap of faith that you just have to get out there and try. Yeah. How do you plan for some of your shots then? Well, one of the things that I use, and I would recommend this to people uh, if you're interested in photography, there's an app called the Photographer's Ephemeris. And um, if you just go to the App Store and type in E-P-H, Ephemeris will come up because nobody knows how to spell it, even me. But the Photographer's Ephemeris is a great app because it'll show you where the sun and the moon are going to rise and set, where and when, anytime 
on the pl- anywhere in the planet, any time of day, uh, or any day of the year, I should say. So, for example, the reason I went to this place, the Fire Island Lighthouse, is I knew from looking at the photographer's ephemeris that if I was in this particular location, I would be looking across the water, looking at the lighthouse, and the sun would come up right behind it. And that's why I drove to that location. And as I said, I initially thought I wasn't going to get anything, that the fog was just going to obscure everything and I wouldn't get a shot. But like I said, the, the, the sun came out, made everything beautifully bright orange. So I got the lighthouse is nice and sharp. The sun is rising right behind it and everything around it is just this beautiful glow of orange. It's just a beautiful shot. But that app, and it's not hard to use, that's where I really get my inspiration on where and when because like I said, it'll show me where the sun and the moon, I, in fact, I just did a, a moon rise. Um, you know, we had in April, just a couple of days ago, last week was a super moon. And a super moon means it's when the moon is at the closest to the earth. And that happens because the orbit of the moon is not a perfect circle, it's a slight ellipse. Mm -hmm. And so there's times it's closer to the earth and times it's farther away. When it's at its closest, when you have a full moon and it's at its closest to the earth, it's designated as a super moon. Ultra super moon. Well, it just, it looks a little bigger than a regular moon and it's a little bit more colorful. Um, And so I knew from using the photographer's ephemeris, that it was going to rise out of the ocean in Long Beach at about seven o'clock a couple of nights ago. And so I was able to position myself where I could get a picture of the jetty and I got lucky. I had a person that was just standing on the jetty looking at the moon. And so it's the jetty, it's the water, it's the super moon. And in the background, is um, what's called the Earth's shadow and the belt of Venus. And this is an astronomical phenomenon that you can look for. Anytime you have a clear day, if you look east when the sun is setting in the west and you have a clear view of the horizon, what happens is as the sun is setting, the Earth gets in the way of the light from the sun. So when you're looking east, the, the earth is actually casting its own shadow on the atmosphere. And you see it as a dark blue band along the horizon. And then above that is a bright pink band. And that's light that's not being blocked by the earth. It passes the earth and it gets reflected off the far end of the atmosphere. And just like the orange foggy one, it breaks up into this pink and magenta color. So you get this blue band at the horizon, then you get this pink band above it. And then I had the super moon right in the pink band. And in the foreground, I had this jetty with a person just standing there looking at all of this beauty. And, uh, it was a, it's a really good shot. I, it's a, I just put it on my website, but I used the photographer's ephemeris to figure out where the moon was going to rise, where I needed to be, and when it was going to happen. And so that one app, and I mean, it cost $10, which, you know, people gasp, you know, because most apps are free or they're a dollar. So $10 for an app is like, whoa, my God, you got to be kidding. But If you're into photography, it is really invaluable, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just uh, priceless. So do you you use that to schedule a lot of your uh, photography shoots, photo shoots? Yeah, I do. Because I really, I like including the sun and the moon. And if not that they're necessarily, you know, in the shot, like a picture of the sun, but you want to know where the sun is shining. 
you know, where's the light coming from and what direction am I going to, if I'm shooting with the sun behind somebody, they're going to look like just a black silhouette. Whereas if the sun is shining on them, then you're going to see them clearly illuminated. Yeah. And so obviously it makes a big difference knowing if the sun going to be in front or in back of your subject. So when, when you take photos, what kind of photographer are you? Are you one of those photographers that takes a lot of shots or tries to be as minimal as possible? Um, I take a lot of shots because what's happening, if you think about like the example I just gave with the super moon. So the moon is rising and behind me, the sun is setting. And so the sky is changing. And so I take a picture, click, I take another one five seconds later, it's going to look slightly different. I take another one, it's going to look slightly different. I can't decide how it's going to look. All I can do is take lots of them and then go back and review them later on and say, well, this is the one I like. It's got the best colors. Yeah. It's, it's the sharpest. And there's, there's no way of me deciding in advance. Now, in the case of a macro, that's something where I really only take maybe one or two photos because that's really where you can slow down. Your subject is not moving. You know, it's a flower with a, some beads of dew on it, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to change very much. So I can take my time, frame it exactly the way I want, get as close or as far away as I want, and then maybe just take two or three frames and then, you know, pick the one I like the best. Um, but when you've got the sun rising or setting or the moon is rising or setting, or you have uh, people surfing, you know, you don't know what the surfers are going to do. Yeah. Birds, birds are flying through the scene and you're going like this, you know, with your camera on high speed and going, you don't know which one of those is going to be in focus. Yeah. That's just the nature of the beast. So how, how many photos do you say, would you say you take during those uh, uh, photo shoots? Well, those photo shoots, it could be anywhere from 30 to 50. I mean, I'm not going to be there all day taking hundreds of them. You know, what happens like in the case again. So you kind of get, you got to go get in and go out, like, get in and get out. Yeah. And that's also why the uh, photographer's ephemeris is such a valuable thing. I don't have to be there for an hour and a half wondering when the sun is going to come up or the moon is going to come up. I know when it's coming up. I know when I'm going to start shooting. I know when I'm going to be done. I know when I'm going to be home. Um, but during that 10 minute window, I'm going click, click, click. You know, I'm taking a picture every few seconds. Yeah. Because again, the light's changing, the moon's moving or the sun's moving or Sometimes birds will fly through the scene, which I always like if I can get something animate in, in the image, whether it's a person or it's a bird or it's a butterfly, it just adds an element of life to the photo. And that's, again, that's just random. I can't make the birds fly through. Uh, I can't make this person in this image with the super moon just happen to walk out on the jetty stood there, you know, sort of with her arms folded and just was looking at the moon. And so I got lucky in that, that this person entered the scene and I was able to add that element to the to the image. As a photographer, would you say you're a, a highly organized person? Yeah, I am. I do have a workflow. Um, you know, I mean, I know my camera is usually already set up uh you know before i even leave the house so i'm not like futzing around with it when i'm on the beach or you know in whatever location i'm in um i know ahead of time what lens i want what shutter speed what aperture um not that i might not try different things in the field just for the sake of it but i pretty much know what i'm going to be doing 
And um, like I said, I, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm trying to shoot. If I get lucky and I find something interesting along the way, which happens more often than not, um, then I'll come back with a bonus photo. But uh, I am very organized. And then, you know, I'll put the images on the computer and go through them and pick the one that I like. And that one will get added to the website. And uh, the others usually get deleted because you, you delete your photos. Yeah, I delete a lot of photos, you know, because I just think it's a discipline. I don't want to have a photo that you say, well, this is still pretty good. You know, why, why not keep it? I don't want pretty good. I want the best one. You know, I mean, think about if you do that every day. Yeah, yeah. It's right. it's really interesting, though, because, like, I, I've, I've encountered photographers that will keep all of their work, and they, they, they'll, like, they have backups upon backups, and they have terabytes upon terabytes of, of, of photos, and they'll take 500 photos in one day, you know, and, they, and they'll keep them all just in case. And there's been, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, and that's how most professional photographers um, work. I, I'm sort of the outlier, but um, I just don't want to have all that. Yeah, and I, I also encountered some that will delete a, a fair majority of their photos, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, most, most of those photos never see the light of day. They never get printed. They never get sold, you know. Um, they, they never get used in any way, shape, or form. So, so how much? How many of those photos do you think you delete after after your photo shoot? Um, almost all of them. <laughs> so you, after after so after like those fifty, and you have after your fifty shots for that day, you found one or two. Yeah, you I'll, I'll, the rest. I'll, I'll keep. I'll keep two. Uh, I might keep one or two more if I think that maybe I could <clears throat> develop them differently or crop them differently and end up with a different photo oh wow you know what i mean because yeah. it doesn't it doesn't have to stay the way it came out of the camera yeah you know you could make it square you could make it tall you could make it wide um you know but but the majority of them are going out do you usually do any like photo any photo manipulation do you uh at, saturate more areas do you have, have you done like the the sky swap feature on some of your photos? Uh, sometimes, but I try to get real skies when I can because um, they just look better. And that's the reason I get up early. Um, there's nothing like sunrise. You know, that's, yeah. the best, that's the best time to shoot the sky. And um, as far as making adjustments, you, you have to make adjustments because like I said earlier, the fact that the camera only has one eye and no brain means that if you're shooting a landscape and the foreground is is dark and the sky is light, the camera can't make both of those properly exposed. So you have to decide which one of those you want to get right. Mm -hmm. And then in post-production, you can make adjustments to the other area. So maybe you would make the sky properly exposed and the the foreground would be too dark but you could then lighten it a little bit so it looked and i don't i don't really have a problem with that because all you're doing is you're making it look the way it looked or originally yeah you know you're, you're correcting what the camera um uh couldn't couldn't capture and so um you know, I mean, most people think Ansel Adams is one of the best photographers ever. And from what I understand, he heavily manipulated his images because he was trying to achieve a certain effect. And his attitude was that the camera is not a photocopy machine. Yeah. It's a, it's a tool for producing artwork. And so if you can do certain things to make the image look better, then you do them. What kind of photography that's going on right now that you feel is overrated? Uh, street photography. What's, what's street photography? Street photography is taking candid photos of strangers. 
it's very big in places like uh, urban settings where you just camp out on a corner and you try to take pictures of interesting looking people as they go by but um they just don't resonate with me is that is that a popular thing going on right now yeah it's very big very popular genre um but i just i'm just not into it where is it where is it popular at is it like like um if i were to go on well on instagram would it be like one of the things that's popping up uh, well, if you did a search for street photography, you'd probably find millions of uh, entries. And you just don't like it. Uh, um, why? I, I just I just can't relate to it. So you see a picture of some interesting looking person. Maybe they have their head, you know, the hair is in braids and they've got a crazy hat and they've got a, a thing going through their lip or something like that. And then it's like, well, who is this person? I'm like, I have no idea. Oh, so it's just like the photo like uh, a photographer that goes to a, a random person that has like a a uh, an out of nor an 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 a uh, like a, a, a an appearance that isn't the norm, where they 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 might they might have a face tattoo, or they might have like it could a be spike anything. hair. It's yeah, and it's and they're not posing these people. That's what I when I said candid, it means that the person doesn't even know they're being photographed. Do they get notified after the fact? I'm well, assuming if you, you want to use the photo commercially, you then have to get a um, a, a model release, which means oh. the person has to sign. And to me, that's like the, the last thing I want to do is first take a person's picture without them knowing it and then tap them on the shoulder and go, so, by the way, my plan is to sell this and make money on surprise. Would, would you mind signing away your rights to this? <laughs> um, I'm also, you know, when I, when I think about the images that I'm trying to capture, I'm also trying to envision things that I think somebody would want to put on their wall in their house, something beautiful. Uh, and oftentimes people don't want like photos of strangers in their, in their house. Yeah. Like you can imagine someone buying one of those and their friends saying, well, who is this? I don't know. I just, some dude that just looks cool. Right. I saw this picture and I bought it. <laughs> um, do you have any like pet peeves in the, in the photography world? Photography world. Is it photography? What would you call it? The photography world or the, the world of photography? The world of photography. Do you have any pet peeves? Mm, not really. Not really? <laughs> All right. Um, John. Yeah. What advice can you give to other artists? Uh, take pictures every single day, even if you're just going to delete them just so you can learn what the camera captures versus what your eyes saw. And then, uh, you know, practice putting them on the computer and making some adjustments to them and see what you can create and uh, just keep shooting. Keep take, shooting. Take lots of courses. I mean, there's a million free tutorials on YouTube on uh, every imaginable type of photography. Yeah. Type in any search term you want related to photography, and you're going to come up with a whole bunch of um, tutorials, and that's how you learn. So, you know, you'll watch a 10 minute tutorial on how to do a certain thing, and then you go practice it, and now you know how to do it. Do you have um, any dream projects that you'd like to do? Um, not really. Uh, not really? No. I mean, I, I like I like where I am. Um, I mean, you know, all of the great places of the world have been photographed, you know. So it's not like I'm dying to go to Mount Everest to get a picture of it, you know. People know what it looks like. I uh, I talked, I spoke with another photographer and he was showing me uh, 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 a scene where uh, 
there's like a line of photographers. Matt, I'm just uh, going to move my location if you don't mind. You're moving. I'm moving. Yes. It's going to look like a um, one of those those GoPro videos. Right. It's uh, it's getting late in my household, and some people want to go to sleep. So I'm just going to relocate to a different spot. Are you going to do like a, a a scene from what was that 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 movie? The the oh gosh, that movie where the the Blair Witch Project, and you're going to say you're you're so scared, and then <laughs> and it, you're look the it, it, you, we're gonna you're gonna pan up to the uh, so you're having a weird cropping of your face. I'm so scared. Yeah, <laughs> it's so dark out here. I, I um, uh, so I'm, I've I've moved and I'm settled now. I hope this wasn't too disturbing to you. <laughs> audience so, <laughs> so you don't have any uh dream projects uh no it's um it's it's really you know each day is like a challenge to try to think of the hardest part about photography really is trying to find something interesting and worthwhile to photograph yeah because you know like i said all of the major attractions of the world have been photographed a yeah. billion times, right? We all know what the Statue of Liberty looks like, and you know we know what the Colosseum looks like. Um, so trying to come up with something that's interesting and uh, appealing to people is, is the hard part. You know, pressing the shutter is, is relatively easy. So, but no, there's no... It's not like I'm dying to save up the money to go to so and so place. Yeah. You know, in fact, it's the opposite because my emphasis is I'm trying to show where I live. You know, this is Long Island. It's a beautiful place. And I'm trying to show all the different aspects of it, whether it's just a picture in my backyard or it's a big expanse down at the beach uh, or it's a bridge going over a waterway or it's a fishing pier that you know a lot of the people that buy my images live on Long Island yeah because, you know they they know the scenes and you know they go fishing by the Fire Island Lighthouse yeah. all the time so they want a picture of it in their home um, and other people know about Long Island. It's a pretty famous place. Um, and, you know, I, I get messages from people all the time saying, I've never been to the ocean. So they'll buy a picture of the ocean. You know, so now they have a picture of the beach and they're yeah. in their home and somewhere in the middle of America where they don't have access to an ocean. Maybe you want to be uh, become John Scala, the the king of Rhode Island, of Long Island, Lo Long Island. Why yeah. do I think of Rhode Island? Long Island. Yes. Maybe you want to be king, become the king of Long Island. Right. I want to dominate the scene. Maybe you already are that. Uh, would you Would you say you are, or or uh, are there other like uh, heavy hitters in in, in Long Island? There, well, there are millions of photographers. There really are. You know, um, when it comes to the to the business side of actually having people purchase your artwork, it's a, a big part of it is not just the image. It's sort of developing a relationship with the person that follows you. Of course. You know, so someone will follow you on... Well, like they follow you, you know, they'll they'll follow your your YouTube channel and and get to like your style and uh, and like your work and uh, subscribe to your channel. So it's the same thing with me, where I'm trying to get people to eventually feel like they know me and they like me and they want to have something that I created. Yeah, and it isn't necessarily something that's impossible for somebody else to produce you know like, yeah like any good photographer could have made this image but i wanted to get it from john because i know him and i like him and i've been following him on facebook and um 
he emails me every week and uh, you know we've had conversations back and forth online and you know uh, so that's why that, that's that that's a big part of it it's not so much being the, you know the the best photographer yeah it's that's one of the 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 that's actually a tip for like any artist is you gotta you gotta have relationships with your with your customer base you know exactly, you gotta yeah. you gotta have and it, and it, and it, that's something that like corporate America can't really do where they can't be personal in the same sense that as as an artist or uh, like solo entrepreneurs where they they can be personal they can they can share their life in a way that a, a giant company can't you know right yeah and the way I do that is a lot of times I'll do a Facebook lives where I'm filming myself with my cell phone you know as I'm doing a photo shoot so it's very spontaneous it's just off the cuff and the people realize that they're dealing with me not a big corporation they're not dealing with Starbucks and and buying this corporate thing yeah that they're dealing with an individual person who's creating these images and turning them into works of art by putting them on canvas and framing them and signing them and um you know so they it's it's more of a a, a connection even if we never physically meet you still feel a certain connection that uh, i was actually watching john in the process of making this image and then you know the next day he posted it the final result and it was beautiful and I love it. And now I want it. That's awesome. John, um, do you have any words of wisdom that you'd like to share? Uh, <laughs> That's a great one. Well, <laughs> I, I think I gave you the words of wisdom earlier when I told you to put money in your 401k. <laughs> pay, pay off your credit cards. Oh, that's that. Those are those are really that's really important stuff that I think Americans need to know because, as you as I we we talked about, like Americans, the average American can't afford a six hundred dollar emergency. Right. Right. You got to have some money in the bank. You got to have some net worth. You know. Um, as far as words of wisdom regarding photography, it's it's what I said earlier. Um, you know, I have a camera right here. I take pictures every day. This is my macro lens. It's already set up. So if I see that it's a, a nice dewy morning, I'll just go out there and see if I can find something. And then secondly, on my tripod already mounted is the lens I mentioned earlier. It's the 24 to 300. So this zooms, I'll turn it. Oh, those are some pretty, that's some pretty uh, impressive yeah. hardware. So these are ready to go. And that's, that's the best advice is to just always have a camera with you. Be prepared. And always be taking pictures. You never know when you're going to see a nun on a unicycle. And if you don't have your camera with you, now I know the answer that a lot of people say is, well, I'll have my cell phone. And cell phone's great. And I have some great images on my website that have, I've taken with my cell phone. But the cell phone has its limitations. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you don't have zoom on it uh, beyond a certain limited range. I know people will go like this and pinch, but that's not really zooming. Uh, that's that's a form of cropping with they're actually el they're eliminating pixels from their image um, so it's always a good idea to have a camera with you take pictures all the time even if you're just going to delete them I mean I take pictures I'm in my den right now I'll take pictures of my the dog bed and see what it looks like and then I'll change the white balance and it'll look more golden I'll change it again. It'll look a little bit more bluish. And so learning those things, le learning how this will change the outcome of the photo is a, is a critical part of it. 
you know, because I can operate, I could really operate these cameras with my eyes closed because I'm so used to know, I know where all the buttons are. You know what I mean? I can change the shutter speed. I can change the aperture and that's, it needs to become second nature. If you're looking at your camera and you go, all right, I want to take a picture. How do I do this again? Oh, all right. First I have to turn this on. Oh, and this, this is not right. I have to adjust that and you, you know, then the moment's gone. So those are my words of wisdom, you know, pick up a camera every day, take some pictures. You might even catch some good ones, but <laughs> even if you're just taking them just to, like I said, see the difference between what your eyes saw and what the camera saw, and you'll learn after a while how to make adjustments so that you can get the image that you want. John Scala. Yes. Um, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day to talk to me. Thank you. Know, you. I enjoyed this. Yeah, and, and sharing a little bit. I know that you're 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 a little bit wary about whether or not you'd be able to, to speak for more than an hour. Right. Uh, but it looks like you 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 accomplished that. We're up to an hour forty one so far. So Yeah, yeah. It's a record broken by a long shot. For you, yes, definitely. Yes. Um John, where where can people find you on the internet? Uh well you know, on my um, my Facebook page is just John Scala Photography. Not complicated. My uh, website address is johnscalaphotography.com. Again, pretty easy to remember. Uh, the only one that you'd want to write down is my Instagram uh, username is at jscalaj. I wanted to be Jay Scala, but that was taken. Darn. Don't you hate it when that happens? So it's Jay Scala J. And um, yeah, that's that's basically it. I would say if you're if you like the things I've talked about, you could uh, send me a friend re re request on Facebook and uh, start following me and liking my images and commenting on them. I I answer back all comments on all photos so if you see something that uh, you like and you say gee i love this photo you know i, I wish i were there i will write back to you and if you want to write something back to me we can keep the conversation going as long as you want um if you want to have a conversation about images on my website uh, my phone number is on there. My email is on there. And I'm happy to talk to people and uh, give my thoughts about what would be right for a certain situation. And there's also a couple of tools that I have on my website that allow you to actually pick an image that you like and see how it's going to look in your house, in the spot that you're thinking of putting it. And so I can explain to people how those work. They're simple. What's it called? What's that called? Well, there's two of them. One is called a wall preview. And what it does is it'll show different settings, a bedroom, a fireplace, a sofa, a nursery. And you can pick an image and it'll be inserted into that scenario. You can then change the size of the image to see okay this is a little too small or too big uh you can change the color of the wall so it's going to start out as white but if your walls are yellow or orange or whatever you, there's a drop down menu you can change the color so you can take the image take the wall color take the setting take the size and put it all on this screen and you can really get a good sense of what um, it's going to look like in your home. And the other one is called the uh, preview tool. It's a, the wall preview where you can use your cell phone and take the image and actually project it onto 
the spot that you're thinking of hanging it. And so you can see exactly how it's going to look in that spot. And that's important because sometimes just changing the size by a couple of inches could make a big difference. You know what I mean? Uh, you can't always tell just by, you know, saying, well, 18 by 20 might look good here. This shows you exactly how it's going to look, you know, over your credenza or wherever you're planning on putting it. So there's two different tools. They're a little bit different. Uh, they're very easy to use, but um, if anybody needs a little tutorial, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, get on the phone and talk them through how to use them because it really, you know, buying something that you're going to hang on your wall for a long time, you want it to be just right. And uh, these, these two tools let you get it really, uh, I would say, exactly right. John, thank you again. Uh, it's thank been you. a pleasure. Uh, thank you. Everyone, thank you, everyone that watched this video. I really do appreciate you. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and watch my weekly interviews with interviews with artists all around uh, with artists around the world. Uh, feel free, please, please feel free to contact slash follow John Scala on all his social media platforms. Um, Let's see here. I think I'm missing something. I don't feel like I'm No, I'm not missing anything. Anyways, I wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you again for watching. Oh, here's what I was going to say. For, for If you're an artist and you want to be on this uh, platform, if you want to be interviewed, drop me a line, contact me, and I will see if I can schedule in schedule, schedule you in for the year. I, I'm like slurring my words, John. It's like Getting slurring. late. You're yeah. Reaching, I, you're reaching your limit. Yeah, my limit. Uh, um, so if you're interested in being a part of this interview series, feel free to contact me and uh, let's let's make it happen. Anyways, thank you so much, John. Thank you, everyone that watched. I hope, you. You have, I hope you have a wonderful day or wonderful night. Cheers. All right. Have a good night. Take care, everybody.